This is The Joe Gaither Show on BamaCentral.com. Good afternoon, Tuscaloosa. Internet world, West Alabama, how we doing today on this Friday? It's a football Friday. You guys are checking us out, the Joe Gaither Show on Bama Central, BamaCentral.com. Watching us on the Bama Central YouTube channel or on my own social media machines at Joe Gaither 6. And it is a huge, huge, huge week. You could also be listening to us on your favorite podcast platforms, Spotify. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or on Amazon, the Joe Gaither Show on Bama Central. We are here for a very special football Friday. We are going to talk about the third Saturday in October. We're going to bring on some of our friends. We're going to find Hunter DeSiver of BamaCentral.com. We're going to reach across enemy lines and find Caleb Sisk from Tennessee Volunteers on SI. We'll grill him, put him under the microscope, and find out what Tennessee is going to bring to this game. And we'll hopefully we'll find Katie Windham at some point as she is wrapping up some of her appointments for the morning and should be joining us shortly. But before we do tell you about, uh, before we do jump into Football Friday, we need to tell you about our friends at Purple Turtle Roofing. Purple Turtle Roofing is the most reliable residential roof replacement company in Alabama and Mississippi. Whether it's addressing leaks, storm damage, or general wear and tear, Purple Turtle Roofing is going to be there to deliver exceptional roof repair for your property. Purple Turtle Roofing is the leading expert in local residential roofing solutions, specializing in providing unparalleled service and quality craftsmanship for all your roof replacement needs. Call Dustin Foley and his team today at 877-PT-ROOF-5 for your free inspection. That's 877-787-6635 to schedule your appointment and one of their qualified employees will come check out your roof for free. And make sure you're prepared for all of life's storms. You can check them out online at RoofTurtle.com. So let's get that out of the way and let's do it. Let's have a little fun on Football Friday. First off, Hunter DeCyber, how we doing, sir? I'm doing good. I'm excited for Football Friday. Absolutely. You can find Hunter DeCyber on the Twitter machine at Hunter DeCyber. That's D-E-S-I-V-E-R. And we're also uh, it's all it's also our pleasure to be joined by Caleb Sisk. He is a staff writer for Tennessee Volunteers on SI. It looks like he's writing a lot of recruiting for the Volunteers, so we'll get into that a little bit with him as well. You can follow him on the Twitter machine at Caleb Sisk underscored. Caleb, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for your time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank, thank you so, you so much, much for having, having me. me. Absolutely. Well, let's just start with you, Caleb, because uh, you are the guest. Uh, what's uh, going on in Tennessee? How's the week been? And really, what's the pulse in Knoxville with the third Saturday in October upon us? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's just fuel to the fire. fire. This, this team has, has been, been looking to improve, time. especially after a underwhelming performance with the Florida Gators as they defeated Florida in overtime. Um, many anticipated that Tennessee would defeat the Florida Gators, you know, in regulation by much more. So the fact that they only, you know, went in there and they defeated the Florida Gators 23 to 17, that's just fuel to the fire. This uh, staff has definitely been pushing the the narrative that, hey, this game's much more bigger than that. You got to look at it as your zero and zero moving forward. And that's how Tennessee has to look with already having one loss on the season. This team is pushing a playoff spot, especially if they win this game. So it's just fuel to the fire and being in front of 101,000 fans, I mean, you can't ask for much more pressure, and um, they're definitely going to come ready to play. Well, over the last couple of weeks, Caleb, Alabama and Tennessee have looked really, really similar, both losing on the road to inferior opponents, Vanderbilt for Alabama, Arkansas for Tennessee. Last week, struggle wins at home, South Carolina for Alabama, Florida, as you just mentioned, for Tennessee. A lot of the focus for at least the Tennessee side, I mean, we've got the Alabama side down pat. We've talked about Jalen right, right. Milrow and the defense uh, at nauseum. Why don't you tell us kind of what's been going on with Tennessee as far as why they've been struggling? I know that Nico Iamalialva is under fire, kind of not being able to get yeah, the ball yeah. down the field, pass protection. Just kind of what, in your opinion, has been some of the issues for Tennessee over the last couple of weeks? You know, it's easy, especially for fans that you see all over social media, it's easy for them to try to say, hey, this is a play-calling issue. But that's not the case. Um, you can make that case when they played Oklahoma. You can make that case when they played Arkansas. But eventually you have to turn your focus when the uh, when the 
non-success from anything continues, you have to turn the focus to something else, especially once it continues three weeks. Um, you're talking even a bye week in between the uh, Arkansas and Oklahoma games. So you're talking about weeks of unsuccessful um, things, and, and that definitely plays a factor. So I do – in my own personal opinion, I do see struggles from Nico Yamaliava at quarterback. I think that, you know, you can definitely tell that he's a redshirt freshman back there. He makes those mistakes that, you know, even you wasn't seeing Joe Milton last year making for Tennessee. The offensive line has struggled a little bit, especially since being banged up in Oklahoma. You know, you can make the case that they're not 100%, but, you know, I don't buy into that because I feel like we're in the or at that point in the season where no one's 100%. You got – people who's banged up on both sides. So, um, yeah, definitely Iam Aliava's got to play a little bit better. He's got to make better decisions, have um, confidence in himself, be able to get the ball to both wide receivers. Um, you know, if he can't do that, it could get ugly very quickly. But, you know, the staff definitely has a lot of confidence in him. Well, he's got a lot of talent, and I mean, he's a real. Uh, I mean, he's got all the tools that uh, that seem to have given Alabama trouble over the years under Nick Saban. Now, obviously, it's a different mm-hmm. defense, but we're seeing a lot of similar cracks with quarterback run and dynamic quarterbacks really getting after right, right. Alabama this season. He's got that as well. Let me ask you: You mentioned about injuries, and then you mentioned about health wise, and nobody's being mm-hmm. nobody, nobody healthy. And you're absolutely right on that. For Tennessee, Cam Peely. This is the first week. Correct me if I'm wrong. This is the first mm-hmm. week that he is uh, no he tore his ACL this past week against Florida. Yeah, yeah. Correct. Uh, just what kind of a loss is that going to leave for Tennessee? How big is that hole going to be? How can they fill that hole uh, on Saturday? Yeah, I mean it's a loss on and off the field. If that makes sense, Joe. Um, when you think of Keenan Pilly, he was nicknamed Unk by this uh, by this team because he plays that role. He's the leader for this team. He uh, the oldest player on the defense, you know. So losing him is is already huge, and it's a big loss when you lose your captain, uh, especially at the linebacker position, arguably the most important position on the field for defense. But um, you turn to Jeremiah T. Lander, who has been playing some valuable minutes already despite um, Keenan Pilly and Arian Carter already having those spots locked up. And T-Lander looked good against Florida, but you can definitely tell that Keenan Pilly uh, wasn't on the field. But him going down um, in the first quarter get, did give Tennessee a lot of time to work with T-Lander to move guys in like Caleb Perry and people um, like Jalen Smith. So Tennessee's definitely working some things out, but – the depth takes a huge hit because the guys that you were planning on using in, in you know, minutes where, you know, maybe Peely or Arian Carter was um, gassed, you know, now they're, they're turned into bigger roles or they're turned into a starter spot. So that's definitely something to watch. So, yeah, I mean, you couldn't have asked for like a more devastating injury with Peely going down. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's huge. That's definitely something you something have to, you watch, have to for. watch for. Well, with Alabama trying to get its offense really finding consistency, Alabama's offense has been able to get big plays all year, but really needs to find consistency. I'm wondering that if that injury will play into the Crimson Tide's favor and really help them kind of find oh, yeah, a groove yeah. on Saturday. It, it, it most it definitely, definitely will. will. Um, that's, um, something that's something that Alabama, Alabama is going to be able to attack, attack, I believe, attack, I believe because, because of the, the – I'm not going to say inexperience because T. Lander has gotten, gotten some reps, reps even since last year. But, um, you know, he's not Keenan Pilly. He's not a guy that's been there for six or seven years. He's not a guy who's going to, you know, be the captain of a a defense right now. So um, that's definitely something that Alabama can attack. And, you know, watching Alabama, you know, they're going to try to run the ball with Jalen Milrow, um, typically guys like the spy linebacker. So that's definitely something to watch. Caleb, I've got a friend who is a diehard Tennessee fan, and I love him dearly. But sometimes you watch games as a analyst and as a reporter, and you see things differently than you do as a fan. So I'm just going to ask you about a narrative that he's been throwing at me, and I want to know if it's true or not. You, you Tennessee, spell you know you go into the transfer portal in the off season, you get Lance Hurd from LSU, and probably we were not dummies, spent a nice little NIL package on Lance Hurd to come in and play left tackle. He's been in my ear, can we bench Lance Hurd? Can we bench Lance Hurd? He's not worth his money, X, Y, Z, A, B, C. Has Lance Hurd really been struggling? How has he assimilated to Tennessee, and how has really the offensive line performed? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean 
that's definitely that's like one of those comments that you would make like as a fan because, because you know you're getting irritated at the fact that you know things aren't going right but it's not on guys like lance hurt or john campbell i mean lance hurt has been banged up all season long he's um even on the injury report for this week so that's something to watch he's probable to play um so i mean you know playing banged up playing with injuries you know he kind of just got himself from being injured and uh, labeled as an injury to just playing hurt. So that's definitely something to watch. Um, I think he helps Tennessee. Maybe that's just me personally. I think he definitely helps Tennessee, and it could tell. Um, whenever he was out against Oklahoma, you even had people coming from the blind side and um, strip sack and Nico. So, I mean, I if I was looking at it in Tennessee's point of view, I definitely wouldn't want that happening. And I think Lance Hurd um, prevents that the most. So that's definitely something that – you know, Tennessee's hoping for is hoping that he will play. And I think he makes this team better. We're talking to Caleb Sisk from Tennessee Volunteers on SI. You can follow him at Caleb Sisk underscore. He's writing a lot of recruiting, and a lot of Tennessee football right there for those guys. We appreciate him joining us. Kind of our brother, sister site. Caleb, let me ask you, big weekend in Knoxville. Uh, it's okay if you don't have like an exhaustive list, but – Really, what's the recruiting weekend look like in Knoxville this for, for, for Tennessee? Oh, it's huge, Joe. Um, I was taking a look at it, and this, you know, they had a huge list against Florida, but this is definitely um, much bigger. You can anticipate, I would say, 95% of the commits being there, which is huge. I'm a firm believer that you have to recruit even through commitment um, until pen is to paper. You know, anything can change these days. Um, a bunch of five stars are on campus. Um, you know, Zion Ely is back for the second week, apparently. That's a name that they're trying to get in. Um, you got Emmanuel Iha Iancho, or however you pronounce it. Ooh. I cannot pronounce it. Oh, oh, I know it. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced that. No, that's that. okay. Good effort. You got, effort. you got tons of guys um, on campus. Definitely some targets that they um, are looking to get in. Isaiah Campbell, who is uh, trending towards Tennessee despite not having a visit to Tennessee will now be on campus. He's uh, ranked 33rd in the nation right now, and he just recently decommitted from Clemson as Tennessee was pushing for him. So that's huge for Tennessee as they're trying to get another defensive lineman in this class. Um, got a couple commitments. They've been looking at this linebacker who's committed to Mississippi State. His name's Austin Howard. They're finally getting him on campus. So um, a tons, tons of 2026 and 2027 recruits on campus that they're really targeting. And um, they definitely located their targets uh, real quickly. That's um, that's huge because I'm I, like I said I I think this class is um, rounding up for 2025. So you know 2026 is on deck and they're really hitting that one hard, especially with Faison Brandon being committed. We really appreciate Caleb Sisk hanging out and joining us, previewing the third Saturday in October. Just a couple more questions for uh, for his expertise, Caleb. Two years ago. Uh, it's all pandemonium. What seventeen penalties for Alabama, and it's fifty-two to forty-nine. You get a duck field goal over the goalposts. What's it going to be like in Knoxville if Tennessee wins this game? Uh, will the crowd? Will, will, do you do you think another field rushing is ha field storming is happening? Do you think the goalposts will come down, or was two years ago kind of a moment in the rivalry where? Tennessee said, "We're you know we're back back even. We're back even with Alabama. We don't need to you know celebrate in that fashion." Yeah, I mean, despite being an analyst, um, you know, if you cheer for Tennessee whatsoever, um, you know, when you see a moment like that, it's like, wow, like it's been a long time coming for Tennessee. So that Certainly. was a huge thing. I think that that does not happen because you won't ever have a moment like that again unless, you know, <laughs> it goes another 16, 17, 18 years. Um, so I, I definitely don't think that happens, but I, I definitely could be proven wrong. I mean, it's still Alabama. Alabama's had Tennessee's number for quite some time. There's no denying that. I said the same thing about Florida. Florida's had Tennessee's number. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't think it happens again. I think if Tennessee was to defeat Alabama, I think it will be more calm this time, despite there being playoff implications. How important is Dylan Sampson to what Josh Heupel wants to do in offense? He's everything, man. Dylan Sampson is the offense. Um, you know, I I've truly believe I've been saying it for quite some time. I think you can make the case that Dylan Sampson is the top three back in college football right now. Um, obviously, you hear of guys like Ashton Gentry. You hear of guys like DJ Giddens. But I think Dylan Sampson's up there with those type of guys in terms of talent. 
he can hit you both in the receiving game and rushing attack. And I think, you know, he's going to make a play. He's not going to go down on first contact a lot of the time. So, you know, um, he definitely bails Nico out a little bit when Nico starts to struggle. Um, we've seen it against Florida. He had three rushing touchdowns, and I think that says a lot about Dylan Sampson. Well, Caleb, what do you think we're going to see on Saturday? I mean, we're kind of dancing all around it. Uh, well, I, before we get there, well, I got one, one more, one more uh, kind of easy one. Is it a must yeah. win? Because you look at both teams with one loss. Is this a must win for both squads? That's tough to say because, you know, with it being a 12-team playoff now, um, and 12 seed, I believe, is guaranteed to a group of five. So you're looking at you got to get one of the top um, 11 seeds unless you, you know, you're a conference champion and then you get one of the top four seeds. So it, it's definitely something that is a little bit tricky. Um, definitely believe that, you know, a team like Alabama or a team like Tennessee could get in with only two losses. As for Tennessee, Tennessee's kind of in a must-win situation, but they also have Georgia coming up. So if they can defeat Georgia, and, and even if they lose to Alabama and defeat Georgia, I think you can't leave this Tennessee team out the playoffs. Vice versa, if they defeat Alabama and lose to Georgia, cannot leave them out the playoffs. It's a little bit tricky if you lose both of those games. But, hey, I mean, as for Alabama, if they win this game, I don't think you leave them out, especially if they win out. There's no way. Well, we've been hanging out with Caleb Sisk, and I really appreciate your time. Check him out, Tennessee Volunteers on SI. Win, lose, or draw, you're going to be wanting to check out the Tennessee page on SI as you want to see the other side of the coverage. Follow Caleb Sisk at Caleb Sisk underscore. Caleb, final thoughts on what do you think happens on Saturday? Yeah, and once again, thank you, Joe, for having me on. Thank um, you. Thank it's you. a blast. Would love to come on for a recap or something. That would just be awesome. Um, as for final thoughts, Man, I, I really think this is going to be a great game. I, I think it's not going to be, you know, one-sided. You know, that's typical, especially in the past, like, 20 years. You know, Bama is going one-sided, even if it takes them a half to do so. I think Tennessee walks away with it, though. I do think Tennessee walks away with a 3-10 to 10 point margin. Um, I think the Neyland Stadium effect is definitely going to play a factor. If this was in Tuscaloosa, it may be a little bit of a different story. But just like you said, they're kind of on the same page right now with struggles. So, it's just who can get over their struggles more, and I think it will be easier for a team at home. Caleb, thanks so much for joining us. We'll, uh, we'll look forward to your coverage over the rest of your weekend, man. Thanks for thanks for your time. Thank you, Joe. Absolutely. That's Caleb Sisk joining us, and we definitely appreciate getting the other side perspective. We haven't done that enough this season. We Last season, we did a pretty good job getting an opposing reporter at least once a week to join us, uh, and Caleb really becomes the first. So bad job on Joe, the host. Great job on Caleb, uh, the guest, for joining us. We appreciate his time joining us. Hunter, thank you for being patient, hanging out and joining us. Uh, what was your biggest takeaway from uh, from kind of that Tennessee perspective that Caleb gave us? Well, I mean, it's something we've discussed all week is that Dylan Sampson is the offense, to quote him, and he's absolutely right. This guy Strong has – Yeah, he's got double-digit touchdowns already, and my biggest thing that I'm going to be talking about on this show is how Alabama needs to stop these kind of short three- to four- or five-yard gains, and that's going to be very, very difficult if Sampson's in the backfield. <gasps> well – Let's uh before we jump into Tennessee with you, Hunter. We haven't had John since last week. Let's just uh take you back to six days ago. We're hanging out in Bryant Denny Stadium thinking, oh, Alabama's up 14 to nothing, and all our questions are getting answered. This bad boy's rolling, everything's back on track. And then one of the worst end of halves I have ever seen in Bryant Denny Stadium led to a very dramatic second half. That was my perspective, and I've spent a lot of time talking about it. I'll just set you up right there. How did you endure or receive the uh, Alabama's 27-25 to win over South Carolina? Yeah, I mean, based off the end of the half thing, when we discussed uh, instant analysis, our article video um, right after the game, um, I was talking about how, like, the end of half um, safety and interception created a huge momentum swing for South Carolina going into the locker room. And then the big thing I touched on, um, and I said it maybe two seconds ago, was they kind of took a kind of took the script out of uh, Vanderbilt for um, their first drive of the third quarter, where they just went for these five, six yard gains every single play. And they went five for five on third down. And that fifth third down conversion was a touchdown. And that kind of created like 
even more of a momentum shift for the rest of the game. Obviously, it was kind of a very sloppy second half, but that was really the big thing that it came down to. And we're finally joined by our friend Katie Lindham, wrapping up all her appointments, scooping all the scoops, letting you know what uh, who's going to play and who's not going to play. You'll have to wait till tomorrow to get that information from her. Katie, how are you doing today on this Football Friday? Um, pretty good. Better now. Had a little bit of a hectic morning um, where you know I knew I was driving us to Knoxville this weekend. My car had been acting a little weird, so I decided I was going to go get my battery tested this morning and. Uh, when it start the car when it start which you know last night at my community group we talked about it and um, no, nothing's too small to pray about and you know it, it didn't get miraculously fixed but the prayer was answered by this little sweet man next door that was working on construction that came and helped me clean oh, the battery please. and helped it get started with the because originally it wouldn't even jump um either and so i was like this is just gonna be a nightmare having to get it like roadside assistance but Got it jumped eventually, went and got a new battery. We're good to go for Knoxville now. So Sweet. now I'm a little behind on finishing packing and laundry, but we'll, we'll get up there. We're in no rush. Game's not till tomorrow. Look at God getting you over the hurdles. Amen to that. <laughs> Amen. Well, Katie, we just finished with her friend Caleb Sis. He kind of gave us a Tennessee perspective, talking about their struggles and maybe some of the ways that they're going to overcome their struggles. We just turned to Hunter, who kind of kind of outlined his perspective last week with Alabama still leaving a lot of those questions out there. I'll just open it to you from the football side of things, and please follow Katie Windham and her coverage at Katie Windham underscore. With the result from last Saturday, how much further did you have you taken the questions in your mind about this Alabama football team, or are you pretty much at the same spot, you know, that you were walking into Saturday's game against South Carolina? I don't know. That that's a good question. I, I think I'm pretty much uh like in the same spot as before the game. And that I think what Hunter was just hitting on with those last two minutes of the half were not it was kind of like the, the last two minutes were like a perfect storm of everything going wrong. And then the beginning of the second half was just them not executing and not being able to get off the field, which was obviously the biggest problem against Vanderbilt. So, yeah, th this team is hard to figure out because since that first half against Georgia, have they looked great? No. But they did look great, fantastic in that first half. And so I think we've seen the peaks and I think we've seen um, the valleys and then – Joe, me and you kind of talked about this yesterday when we were recording something, but it wasn't like on air about, you know, I feel like there's been a lot of discourse or discontentment this week with how Alabama played after a loss um, and how, you know, in the past they would have been all fired up after a loss and just come out and killed somebody. And you don't really have to go back very far in history. In fact, you can go back to last season under Nick Saban where they lost to Texas in week two and then played like crap at USF in week three and everybody's, you know, weeping and gnashing of teeth about, oh, this team is horrible. This is the worst saving team. And then do you all remember what ended up happening with that team? They won the rest of their games, won the SEC well, championship. And, made and what happened the next week after the USF loss, after the second week of more consternation? Yeah, you named Jalen Miller the starter, but do you remember what happened in that Ole Miss game? Right, yeah, they're playing a ranked Ole Miss team. They rebound, they play well. So, oh no, no, no! I mean, they they win. But you walk into the locker room in that after that first half, where Nick Saban is. That was one of the most fired up times. He's dressing down Tommy Reese uh, because you're fumbling at the goal line and you're going into the locker room down 14-10 at halftime. Like you eventually won that game against Ole Miss, and yeah, Jalen Milrow went up. But like to your point, Katie, the response last year to the loss to Texas. <laughs> not good. Yeah. It, and so like, and that was even the only game we had seen last year before Texas was, who did they play the first game? Middle Tennessee. Middle so, Tennessee yes. Like they had, like we, we didn't really know anything about, we hadn't seen anything from that team to show us, Oh, they can be great. We've seen that this team can be great. We saw it against Georgia and Georgia. Like, yes, Georgia has struggled some and not looked as good as they have been. I don't think they are as good as they've been the last three years. But they're still Georgia. They still – you know, there's the stat going around the past 
this whole week that they've won their last 50 games, except for against Alabama or whatever the stat is. So it's like they're still Georgia, and Alabama beat them and played really well in the first half, got up 28 to nothing. And, yeah, I guess you could say there's some fluky things that happen, but I don't think that that's a fluke. So we have seen what this team can be. And, obviously, this Saturday is going to be a big um, – we're going to find out for more. Is this team for real? Are they really a playoff contender? Because I think if they win, it doesn't lock up a spot, but it puts them in a really, really good position. And if they lose, it puts them in a really tough position. So, um, yeah, I think that, of course, there are still some questions and concerns after last Saturday in South Carolina. If you're an Alabama fan, you would have hoped they would have played better. You would have hoped they would have come out and just dominated. But also I think it is – it's a product, too, of college football and the SEC are better maybe – top to bottom than they've been in the last couple of years where Vanderbilt, if they don't, you know, blow it late against Missouri or, you know, or especially losing that game at Georgia state, they'd definitely be in the top 25 right now. And the South Carolina as you talked about all last week and wrote about, and we saw on Saturday has a really, really talented defensive line. And so it's not like Vandy and South Carolina are the pushovers they may have been um, in past seasons. And so, yeah, things have not, the Alabama has not been playing at its highest level but, like, you don't have to every week to win. And I think this week they're going to have to play at a pretty high level to win on the road in Knoxville. But um, that's what we'll see and find out. That's exactly what we'll find out. And Hunter DeCyber and Katie Windham will be covering it for you right there at BamaCentral.com, driving up to Knoxville in just a little bit. Hunter, I want to circle back to a question I asked Caleb. I asked him if this was a must-win game for both programs. And I'm picking backing off of, Kay- uh, off of Katie's kind of last paragraph, final thought or two. With this game, you both lost. Okay, you both lost one one game. The SEC championship, you know, three undefeated teams going into this weekend in conference play: A and M, Texas, and LSU. Now that's going to change as you continue to go. But Hunter, just take it. Is this a must-win game for both both programs? It's tough because I feel like I don't really know Tennessee's schedule um, for the rest of the season. But there's probably not many other opponents that are as good as this team. And so the, both teams should hopefully, I shouldn't say hopefully, but both teams will likely win out after this game. But we go. I'll answer your question real quick in 30 seconds. Versus Kentucky, versus Mississippi State, at Georgia, versus UTEP, and at Vanderbilt for Tennessee. All right, yeah. Georgia's obviously going to be a challenge, um, but and obviously potentially Vanderbilt. But um, we're in a 12-team playoff now, so you can afford two losses. Um However, it, it, 12 might seem like a lot, but it really isn't. There's there's a few other conferences out there with plenty of teams that are capable of getting in. And then you got a non-group of five team that's going to get – or a non-power five team or power four team that's going to get in. So that takes up a spot immediately. And then you have the four conference winners. That, then you have seven spots left. And probably three of them are, are going to be in the SEC, maybe four. So And Texas is already probably going to be one of them. So – to answer your question, it probably is a must-win game because um, the field gets smaller and smaller when you really think about it. I, I think you make the exact point that I mean we didn't talk about it; it's not on our notes. But people think a two-loss, a uh, two-loss, you'll be fine; you'll get in the playoffs. But you put yourself basically into the bubble, and you put yourself into a resume stacker, and who's got the best wins? And yeah, your win with Georgia, you know, over Georgia, is a great win, Alabama. It really is a great win. But objectively speaking, you know, we recognize Vanderbilt probably stronger than normal, but that name on paper is an ugly loss on paper, mm-hmm. a disgusting loss on paper. And so you lose to Tennessee, then it gets into – you basically invite the conversations, you invite the holes, you invite the scrutiny. And same for Tennessee, yeah. Caleb is absolutely correct when he says Tennessee can lose this game and go down to Athens and beat Georgia and get into the playoff. That would probably take Tennessee into the playoff. But if you're Tennessee, are you really wanting to stake your playoff chances on having to go into Athens and winning? I don't think that you do. And so it raises, in my opinion, the desperation for this week, Hunter. And with that being raised, how do you think Alabama will answer? Do you think that you'll find the physicality that you've been missing over the last 10 quarters? I mean, there's definitely a, a fire that fans are questioning um, and, and intensity in Alabama in general. And if there's a game where it needs to be lit, it has to be this one. It's as simple as that. But they're on the road. It's, it's a totally different animal. 
Like, it's, it's a really hard question to answer because they're on the road. If they were home for Tennessee, then I'd say absolutely. Like, I think they could get fired up for this, but it'll be tough in Knoxville. Katie, I want to take you right piggybacking off that in two different directions. You were in Brian Denny Stadium last year when Alabama was down at halftime. You were in Brian Denny Stadium when Alabama hits the touchdown pass for Isaiah Bond and basically starts the rally in the second half. How much was the momentum? How much was the crowd at play uh, during that game? And secondly, off of what Hunter just said, wanting to see intensity, wanting to see fire. I want to take you to Thursday night's Hey Coach and ask your opinion about a little bit of the snark that some of the fan base uh, was at. You know, it wasn't overt. It wasn't overt disrespect to Coach DeBoer. It wasn't any of that. But there was just a little bit of um, displeasure laced in some of these questions to Coach DeBoer. So first, how much did the crowd really get a play last year in this matchup, kind of projecting how it might get in play tomorrow? And second, uh, what was your thoughts on the Alabama fan base kind of subtly weaving some displeasure into their questions? Yeah, I think last year, um, I mean, it, it was huge because Alabama didn't play super well in the first half, didn't they get? Did they get down twenty to seven to Tennessee? I think, that, I think it was. But it was it was, uh, it was big because I was having some Tennessee fans text me like, "We got gotcha. you," <laughs> and then ended up winning thirty four to twenty. I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think shut out Tennessee in the second half. Then you have the big Jihad Campbell scoop and score that kind of sealed it uh, in the fourth quarter. And yeah, that was that moment was one of the loudest I've, I'd heard Bryant Denny in a while. But to the point of like passion, or I think this team hasn't really had an issue. I think this team is super passionate. I think Kalen DeBoer is super passionate. He maybe just doesn't display it in ways that people are used to or maybe want to see. But I think we saw with which this this whole moment kind of got brushed over or forgotten about because of everything else that happened in that game before and after. But, I mean, at the, the, the end of the first half of the Georgia game, we saw a little bit of a, you know, it wasn't even like a little scuffle. It was pretty big, like both sidelines going at it. Alabama gets an unsportsmanlike. I think because of the passion those guys are playing with, we all obviously all saw, and a lot was made about Malachi Moore at the end of Vanderbilt. I think there's guys that are passionate on this team, and then they've kind of talked about, and Kalen's talked about too, that they like playing on the road and, you know, getting the energy from the the opposing fans and the us against you mentality and blah, blah, blah. And this really, as crazy as it is, game seven, is kind of really their first real road test because, yes, they played at Wisconsin, but that stadium's not as big or as loud um, as most SEC schools. And, like, there was a lot of Alabama fans in Wisconsin and also their quarterback went down early they kind of never had a shot after that. The crowd wasn't super into it. Obviously, Vanderbilt, they lost that game, but that's not that's never going to be a, a tough environment to play in. So this is your first time playing in that. And I think a lot of times players, college kids, feed off that. They like to get up. They like to draw, you know, to the opposing teams, the opposing fan base. They like to shut up the crowd. They like to empty the stadium. There was no talk of that this week, no quotes about emptying the stadium. But um, so I think the passion will be there, and I think – you won't obviously have a whole stadium getting behind you to give you that momentum, but I think you can also work against um, the crowd. And then kind of to your second question about some of the discontentment or maybe rumblings with Coach DeBoer among the fan base. In a way, I get it, but it's just coming from such an entitled and out-of-touch place of what they've gotten used to. Um under Saban and even realistically well first of all if coming into the year if you said if you told 99 percent of Alabama fans you're five and one at six games they would have taken that now they probably would have thought the loss was to Georgia but I think if you tell them you're five and one with a win over Georgia even if you told them that the people are going to be stoked like I'm sure they're wondering where the if it's not Georgia you know probably none of the other first six games are going to thrill people with the Alabama loss but you're thrilled to be five and one. You're coming off a, a coaching transition at the best coach in college football. And it's it, it's not – yes, you retained a lot of players, but there's also a lot of transition among the, the players and the staff, and it's obviously a new head coach, new system, all that stuff. So I think you would have taken five and one before the season started. And then also, like, it's just not realistic to expect them to be perfect and kind of what we talked about last year or earlier about the example of last year. 
Joe, me and you were talking about this yesterday too. Really, I, I joined the beat full time in 2021. So that would have been Bryce's Heisman year. Um, when Alabama, I guess, lost to or beat Georgia in the SEC championship, but then lost to the Indy. Is that that year or was that 2022? Yes, that was that year. Yeah, yeah uh, 2022, they lost twice in the regular season. Okay. Yeah. Correct. So, really, since I've been on the beat, Alabama's played in a lot of close games. They have not blown out a ton of teams, especially in good games, not like the first part of the Saban era. And I think that just goes along with all the changes of college football um, with NIL and the transfer portal, making things more even with it, maybe creating, um, you know, different attitudes or maybe senses of entitlement for some of the players that like you had Bryce Young win the Heisman in 2021 and do some incredible things from a pure talent standpoint. And Alabama would still be in games down to the wire. It was like that in 2022. They lost, and you know, everybody talked about they lost that Tennessee and LSU game by um, a combined four points, I think. But it was it was another example of a close game where they either had to come back or couldn't hold on to a lead late. And so Alabama playing in close games is not just a new thing because it's DeVore. Like, yes, Saban blew out a lot of teams, especially at the beginning of his tenure. But really, the last couple of years. Um, things have even out more. And so, yeah, of course, I think as an Alabama fan, especially if you you support the team in person, you donate to NIL, you donate to Tide Pride, whatever, um, you're putting your money where your mouth is. And I'm not saying you have to have money to be a fan or that you have to sure. give to be a fan. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying if you're going to openly criticize this much, I would say you probably need to put your money where your mouth is a little bit. Um, if, like, you're not pleased with what's on the field, then I, I don't know. I'm not – which I also don't love the whole concept of, athletic departments asking fans the average like lower middle class fan to like fund the team but Mm -hmm. um I I don't know I just think fans need to like step back a little bit and yes it's okay to be disappointed and frustrated and the way they've played the last two weeks and the loss of Vanderbilt is obviously going to be a shock to the system hasn't happened in you know four decades and um you know, and even though Vanderbilt's better than they have been and potentially a ranked team, Alabama still is a better team and should not have lost that game. All of that is true. But um, I think some of the the discontentment fans have with DeBoer and even going back to his – what he's wearing or his demeanor or whatever, it's like – it's kind of like who, who would you want instead of him? You know, if you – there's if you go look at our YouTube comments, there's tons of people that's telling – you know, go be ready to look for a new job, buddy, to all the defensive coaches and like on K, you know, and it's just like, who who do you think you're going to get? There's only so few coaches out there that have won a national championship. Mayor Bryant. And they're not coming here. Kirby's not, not going to come here. Dan Lanning's not going to come here. Um, it's Bear Bryant. He's coming. Yeah. So, um, Sorry for the Saints for being so long, but I think, but but I think this Saturday we're going to see an extreme overreaction either way. It's either going to be, they win, they're great. He's great. They're going to be in the playoffs or if they lose, this isn't the right guy for the job, which I don't think that's fair either way, because this is going to be a top 15 game on the road rivalry game programs that hate each other that both really need to win. Like y'all talking about earlier. So but that's what sports is all about is an overreaction, you know, and, and we not to say we don't do that either because we do sometimes, but Oof, I struggle with that myself. Absolutely. Hunter, I got one more concept for you to, uh, that I want your comments on or thoughts on, and then we will get into our picks. I just looked at the slate. It's a terrible weekend outside of the conference, but Oh boy, you better keep all your TVs on the sec this week. Hunter, your, my last topic or conf, uh, conversation for you is, something that Katie, she was talking transition in part of her answer, talking about the transition in part of her answer. And it made me think about the defensive troubles and the defensive issues that Alabama has faced this season. And you get a lot of people saying, oh, they're just not trying. Oh, they're just not giving good effort. And I don't know that that's really fair or the case. And then you see, okay, Malachi Moore make a bust on fourth and nine this past week. And I don't think it was an effort issue. I think in the previous scheme, in the Nick Saban scheme, he probably would have been taking the route that he took instead of uh, instead of taking the, the route that he left open. So with all that kind of window dressing, I just want to ask you, how much of the defensive struggles that we have continually seen through the year, how much are they at the feet of just 
these things take time, the transitions take time, or can it be explained? I mean, is it a more dumbed down answer to they're just not trying or the coaches just aren't good or the scheme's not? Uh, it, it, what, 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 how would you boil down the defensive struggles? No, I, I mean, it's, it's none of that. Like, it's not about the scheme or the coaches or they're not trying. It's, it's just simply put, um, opposing teams are kind of figuring it out how to go against the Alabama defense. And I feel like a broken record that I've said this a few times already on the show, but it's not like when typically when other teams try and go against Alabama, you try and go for these long balls. You try and super risky plays because it's really, they don't really have much to lose. But now from what I've seen the past couple games is they try a new strategy or they go for a little short, just short and sweet plays. And they turn into a large um, difference in time of possession. I think against um, Vanderbilt, they allowed like 40 minutes time of possession, which is one of the worst in Alabama football history, at least near the Saban era, somewhere in that area. But um, that really was the main thing. Um, and then, as I said before, South Carolina, second half, they did that most of the time. In the first half, South Carolina really didn't do much on third down. And that was really the case for – most of the second half is that they were able to get these short gains and continue it and keep that time of possession. I know Alabama was winning the time of possession battle pretty easily in the first half, but now I think, I don't remember the exact number, but I know South Carolina won it by a few minutes in the second. Um, so it really comes down to that. And but like if teams are figuring out their defense, wouldn't that be a scheme issue? I mean, I guess. Yeah, but they're going quick. That's the thing with it. Like, they're not, they're not going long. They're just going for these short plays. They're not necessarily big at all. Like I, I guess it is kind of a scheme issue, but yeah, is this something that Alabama really, could adjust to? I, I mean, yeah, they could adjust to it slightly, but it's tough to like. All right, you want like gains to be only like two to three yards when you're on defense, but just one more yard has really kind of killed them a little bit. We'll, we'll have to see how Alabama does on Saturday defensively, uh, particularly with the Tennessee running game that is seventh in the nation. I think that's going to be kind of the crux of the game. Let's pick these games, and we'll save the Alabama-Tennessee game for last, and we'll get kind of final thoughts for each of you if you have some keys or uh, some final kind of uh, perspectives on the game. Uh, we can get into them right there before our pick. We're going to go. Uh, we're starting in the SEC. I think our, the only ranked game that I have outside of the SEC is Michigan and Illinois, and I'm pretty sure that's in the middle of the day. So we'll save that uh, for in the middle of the picks. Auburn is at Missouri, and this is going to be a big game for Alabama to pay attention to because both these teams are on the schedule. Missouri really, really struggled at AM losing, then kind of and beat Massachusetts. Wow, good job. So Missouri has no has one good win over over Vanderbilt. Missouri's a four-point favorite, Katie Wyndham, over the Auburn Tigers. Auburn was off last week. Will Hugh Freeze go in there and get their first SEC win? I've been listening to a couple people or podcasts or radio shows, and they say, you know, Hugh Freeze is going to get one of these eventually. And I think they will, but um, I can't pick Auburn until they prove me wrong or right. So I'm going to pick Missouri. Hunter? Yeah, um, I'm going to go with Missouri as well here. Coaches will never say they're looking towards not like this upcoming opponent, but the one immediately after. Um, obviously, that being Alabama. If Auburn beats Mizzou, then Mizzou is going to get smacked by Alabama most likely. So, Woo. I mean, it's it's that's pretty likely. Um, I'm not going to say it's a guarantee, of course. But for that reason, I think Mizzou is kind of really going to bring it this week and then really focus on Alabama. I think Missouri has uh, maybe the hunger. I think they see a really winnable game. Missouri, I don't want to say Eli Drinkwitz is mentally fragile because I don't know him that well, but it seems like when they see a, a team that they think they can beat, uh, they, uh, they get up and play well for it. 11.45, South Carolina is at Oklahoma. We just saw South Carolina here in Tuscaloosa. We've got to go to Oklahoma here uh, next month. South Carolina is a one-point road favorite, Hunter. Are you taking wow. the Gamecocks to win on the road? 
That's really something. I didn't know they were the favorite. Um, I mean, Oklahoma, they really just got destroyed by Quinn Ewers in Texas last week. I don't really know if they could recover against a team that only lost by two to Alabama. So for that reason, I think I'm going to go with South Carolina here. Yeah, I don't know en- enough about it. Does Oklahoma still have all those receivers out or are they back? I don't I don't know enough about that. Y'all might not either, but I don't know. They, yeah, they I feel like Oklahoma's in a little bit of a tailspin. South Carolina hasn't looked horrible. Um, but then because it's in Norman, I feel like Oklahoma they need this. Oklahoma still has, oh my gosh, one, two, three, four of these wide receivers, Jaden Gibson, Jaleel Farouk, Nick Anderson, and Andrell Anthony listed as out on last night's injury report. All right, I'll go with South Carolina then. There we go. Uh, And wide receiver Deion Burke, who I do know is their star, he's listed as questionable. So I think you might be right there, Katie. I think it's still going to be some tough times in Norman. Uh, So that's three of us, all three of us on the South Carolina train. At 315 – Oh, uh, Texas A&M. Do we even need to cover Texas A&M and Mississippi State? Are we all taking the Aggies? Yes, yeah. Because State's the worst team in the in the conference. Katie, you you going bold? You want to take the Bulldogs? No, I'm not going to. But I heard on the radio yesterday. Apparently, A&M never plays well at Mississippi State, so it could be closer than. It's an 18 point spread. So with that in mind, you may want to take the Bulldogs plus 18. All right, so the only other game that is not in the SEC that's a ranked matchup is still pretty ugly. Number 24, Michigan, is at number 22, Illinois. Michigan is a three-and-a-half-point favorite. I don't watch Big Ten football that much. Hunter DeCyver, you are the northernmost member of the show. Tell us about (laughs) Michigan and Illinois. Yeah, I can't really touch on Illinois much. Um, Obviously, Michigan won the national championship last year, but all their players went to the NFL. Yeah, yeah. All their players went to the NFL, and it seems like they're just kind of lost at the moment. I mean, as did their head coach. Um, he did? You bet. You bet. <laughs> and so I really don't know what to make of Michigan because they just, like like um, Oklahoma, they got crushed by Texas. And obviously Illinois is not as good as Texas, but I'm just not confident in Michigan at all. Illinois, on the other hand, we know has not really been ranked in football for a while, at least – from what I remember. So Illinois is the home team here. I think they could play. Yeah. Well. Okay. I said that that's Brett Bielema, right? It is. Yep. Oh, give me, give, give me the Illini. Katie, you want to stand <laughs> with me? Yeah, I'm going to go with Illinois as well. All right. We'll, uh, we'll take it and we'll, we'll see. Big if win we for Brett Bielema over the defending champs. Exactly. All right. Six o'clock, big game. Number eight, LSU is at Arkansas. LSU pulling it out last week against Ole Miss. LSU is a two and a half point road favorite. Golly, I cannot get myself to respect Arkansas despite the results that happen each and every week on paper. Katie, will Arkansas get another SEC upset here? I think so. I'm going to go with Arkansas at home. I feel like LSU could be in a little bit of a letdown after their big win last week. Um, I feel like sometimes these Arkansas-LSU games get a little crazy, get a little wonky, so I'm going to go with Arkansas. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm going to go with LSU here. I think that win against Ole Miss kind of lit a fire um, for this upcoming week, and I think they win pretty handily, honestly. See, the first week that I actually pick Arkansas will be the week that they lose. Oh, <laughs> so let me just go ahead and do it. We'll pick Suey. Let's take Arkansas to win at home. Uh, we'll skip in Vanderbilt at Ball State or, or Ball State at Vanderbilt because uh, everybody's taking Vanderbilt, the, the mighty Commodores, right, 27-point favorites. At 6.30, number five, Georgia, is at number one, Texas. Obviously the big game of the day, and hopefully you guys are done with your time in Neyland Stadium. Hunter DeCyber, the Texas Longhorns, are four-and-a-half-point favorite. It's Georgia's second big road game. What will Georgia have learned from their time in Bryant Denny Stadium? Yeah, I mean, this is a real big game for Georgia. I mean, because they got a crazy schedule as it is, and they already have a loss on there. So losing to Texas would be, like, really detrimental to their success. Um, and then they got to play um, Ole Miss, I believe, in a couple of weeks too. Um, yeah. I think they'll win that game, but still, I think that'd be close. But I think just Texas is a little too overpowered at the moment, especially since they're home. And I'm going to go with the Longhorns here, simply put. Oh, yeah. no, just another reason. Um, Mississippi State put 31 points on them, on Georgia. So there you go. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. 
Yeah, I feel like Texas is – this is their their big moment in the SEC. This is their first big game where all the – as an SEC member, where the spotlight's going to be on them. Um, this is, you know, why they wanted to play in the league, to be able to host these type of games. But I think I'm going to go with Georgia. Um, I think this is kind of a must – not like we talked about, is this game a must win for Alabama and Tennessee – it's not a must must win for Georgia because like y'all said, they do still have some other big games on their schedule with Tennessee and, and Ole Miss where they can get some quality wins. But um, I don't know. I feel like they're, they're not going to be phased by the environment necessarily because they've already played at Alabama and they're used to playing in these big games and winning these big games. And Texas, if I'm not mistaken, has not really played anyone great yet. It's kind of like anyone. when Ole Miss finally played – well, actually, they played, They lost to Kentucky first. But a lot of times this season we've seen when a team finally plays someone that's good, they're getting punched in the mouth a little bit. And Georgia is not as good as they have been, but they still have a lot of talent. So I'm going to go with Georgia on the road. I really love and appreciate your boldness because I think it's very obvious. Like the, all the obvious picks are taking Texas. Um, not that it is an obvious pick. I think it will be a very close game, and I think it will be a really, really intense game. Uh, one I'm really looking forward to, but y'all know I have a secret Texas affinity, so I'm taking Texas to to uh, to definitely come out on top and uh, keep going undefeated in the conference. I think it's going to be a great game. I'm looking forward to seeing what Steve Sarkeesian can do with Kirby Smart. We got what one more game left to go in the SEC before we pick our game. It's Kentucky at Florida. I cannot believe we're picking this game. What a horrible game to, to watch! Don't watch this game. Keep your your, your TVs on ABC. Hunter Decipher. Kentucky is a one and a half point favorite in the swamp. Are you going to take the a home underdog? Do it. I think I'm going to. I think I'm going to take Kentucky here. Um, I mean, they do they beat or. Did they lose to South Carolina, right? They Kentucky did. lost to South Carolina. Yeah, for that reason. I, and it was it was relatively close from what I remember. No. no they got blown out. No, they, got beat the, they, took them, they beat the brakes off of them. All right, you know what? Never mind. We're going to go with the Gators here. <laughs> <laughs> they played Georgia close. Yeah. Kentucky yeah, did. that's why. Okay, that's what I was they thinking. They beat Ole Miss on the road, but they let, got blown out by South Carolina. And yeah, yeah. They beat right. Ole Miss. They lose last week to – um. There's a Vandy. Yeah, so, okay. yeah. So they're, I feel like they're kind of, but losing to Vandy, no shame in yeah. that, you know? No. Yeah. Only elite teams lose to Vandy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, because both these teams are sitting here at three and three. So, like, I can see either team, like, just folding in on themselves and not want, because, like, it looked like last week for a minute that, Billy Napier was going to get this big win, maybe save his job, move to four and two and actually be in like a good spot. And then you, you don't go for two at the end and then you end up losing in overtime. And so like, I just don't know how much fight either team kind of has left in them. And because of that, I'm going to have to go with the home team and go with Florida. I'm taking Florida as well. The fighting DJ Lagways. I think that he is gifted enough to overcome bad coaching. Uh, and so I think that they will uh, they will win uh, and and really put the spotlight on Coach Stoops. All right, let's finish this bad boy up. I really, really, really appreciate Hunter DeCyver and Katie Windham for joining us on Football Friday. You already follow them. If you don't, go follow them now at Hunter DeCyver on Twitter and at Katie Windham underscore on the Twitter machine. They will be in Knoxville this weekend for number seven Alabama against number 11 Tennessee, 230 on ABC. Katie Wyndham, the Crimson Tide, are right now a three-point favorite. What are your final thoughts, maybe a key to the game? What are you going to be looking for in, in Neyland Stadium, and what's your pick? I think that the what I'm going to be watching for are kind of a key. Well, I think this is like always – this isn't what I was originally going to say, but always a key for me and any coach pretty much is who wins the turnover battle, especially because this defense has struggled to get off the field. If they're able to – get turnovers it takes the other team off the field without them having to like get a traditional stop and so can Alabama get some some turnovers on the road can they keep control of the ball and not turn it over themselves I think we're halfway through the season and we still haven't 
seen Alabama score a non-offensive touchdown. Can they have that to spark a big play? They had one last year against Tennessee. They had one in Knoxville in 2020. Um, so, uh, you know, c- can that happen? I think, you know, you said it's a three-point spread. I-, I tweeted after the game last week that Graham Nicholson has attempted two kicks this year. So if you get – last time at Tennessee, Will Reichard, who's your, you know, all-time leading scorer, misses a kick – at the end that sets up Tennessee being able to win. I think if you're Alabama and it comes down to a kick this week, you might be in a little bit of trouble because you haven't, you haven't faced, you haven't even faced like regular kicks, much less that high intensity, high pressure of a scenario. So I guess that's kind of a key too. will Graham Nicholson be able to make his kicks. I, it, it's tough for me to pick this game because the last week I'm like, Oh yeah, Alabama will cover. It's, nope. Hasn't. <laughs> covered the spread but then I do think this team has maybe showed a tendency whether they intend it or not to kind of play up to the competition and so I think that they're gonna um, come out and play fast I think actually okay sorry for rambling my big key is Joe we talked about this yesterday I think if Alabama gets the ball first and scores and gets the lead and never falls behind, I think they win. Well, obviously, if you never fall behind, you're going to win. But I think if you have the chance to get ahead, um, I think they're going to win. So I think that's going to be kind of my key. But I will pick Alabama to win. Hunter, before you start, 45 yards, Graham Nicholson, one kick, three seconds left, make or miss. And you got to bank on the Lou Groza winner from last year. Oh, you got stoned. Oh, trailing by two points or is it a tie game? No, no, yeah, that, to, to win. Like, you're, you're trailing. Make obviously, he's had, a, he's had a small sample size of kicks and obviously missed one of them. But I'm banking on how he played last year to do this one kick. Oh, I like your stones. I, I appreciate your, your conviction. Continue. Yeah. Final thoughts on the game. Key maybe for you and your pick. Yeah, I mean, obviously I said the defensive key is to eliminate the short gains, but one way to do that, um, because obviously the time of possession battle is so important, last few games, um, Jam and Justice, they kind of start with a few carries uh, to open the game, and it's worked offensively. They get in the end zone and they take a lot of time off the clock, but then in the second half, they kind of just both like disappear from the game plan, and I think just sticking with them, both of them, um, could really be a key here. And if they do that, I could see Alabama winning it. But if they do what they have for the last couple of weeks where um, first half they use them, second half they don't, then I could see it going Tennessee's way. So what are you picking? I think uh, it's you, we can't play a Spence game here. All right. All right. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to go with Tennessee here. Um, I think them being the home team here is also very crucial. Whew. All right, all right, all right. I think that we've had a lot of fun this week covering the third Saturday in October. We want to apologize again to everyone for having some tardiness with our episodes and appreciate everybody for their patience. We, we did get them all in. We, we got all four in for the week, so that's great. Katie and Hunter, I'm not jealous of y'all one bit. They're going up to Knoxville in about an hour. I get to sit on my fat rear end and watch all the football on my own screen with the dog away from the madness. Hmm. I I can't pick Tennessee. I just cannot do it. Nothing. I don't. I don't have a single cell in my body that will allow me to do that. I think it's going to be very close. I'm well. Full disclosure on an earlier radio show in the, this week, I did pick Tennessee. But now that we're this much closer to the uh, to the to the kickoff. I think Alabama will win. I think Kendrick Law's availability will unlock the offense uh, in, in ways that we didn't really realize it with his uh, with his absence. Obviously, when he was there, he, the offense was rolling, and now that he's been out, the offense has been kind of junked up a little bit. I think that his return will kind of re-spark the running game. Hunter, to your point, Jam and Justice, I think that they will get going because of what Kendrick will be able to do, keeping the defensive coordinator kind of in limbo, wondering if Alabama is running or passing. I think his usage kind of masks what Alabama wants to do from a pre-snap kind of determination, and that makes everything really hard to guess. Defensively, goodness gracious. Will the six guys up front win? Will it be Tim Smith, Tim, Tim Keenan? Will Jamarian Latham, Deontay Lawson, Jihad Campbell, and Quay Russo? Will they win? If they win, uh, if they're winning consistently above average, 
uh, then Alabama will win. He can pressure Nico Iamalialva and uh, get a turnover or two. I think Alabama ends up winning, and everybody on the Alabama side smokes cigars. Hunter, don't smoke a cigar. It's bad for you. It's, it's, it's bad for you. Um, <laughs> and Katie won't like it in her car anyways. But I think all the Alabama fans will be smoking cigars at the end of the night at uh, 20, at 30, yeah, at 31, 31, 25, 31, 24 is kind of what I'm feeling. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm feeling. Oh, no, I thought you were waving. Okay, no. Uh, that's going to do it for our show today. We appreciate everybody joining us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Joining us on the Bama Central YouTube channel. Please subscribe to the Bama Central YouTube channel. Everybody will be up in Knoxville getting you video from inside the bowels of Neyland Stadium after the game and any kind of extra content from the weekend they'll, they'll put up at the Bama Central YouTube channel. Follow Katie Windham again at Katie Windham underscore Hunter DeCyber at Hunter DeCyber and follow all of our coverage at Alabama Crimson Tide on SI. It's going to be a great weekend. We hope you all enjoy your third Saturday in October. Win, lose, or draw. We'll talk to you on Monday reacting to the game. Oh, I'll have Mason on Monday. That'll be a lot of fun. That'll be my first time having Mason uh, in a, in a, a full-time teammate, so we're really looking forward to that. And we will react to the Alabama-Tennessee game right here on the Joe Gaither Show on Bama Central and BamaCentral.com. Thanks for joining us on today's edition of the Joe Gaither Show on Bama Central. Keep up with Joe on all his social media pages at Joe Gaither 6. Subscribe, rate, and review the show on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and be sure to read us daily at BamaCentral.com. <laughs>